This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good afternoon. I'm William Lester, Professor of Chemistry and Chair of the Hitchcock Professorship Committee. We're pleased, along with the Graduate Council, to present Professor Sidney Altman, this year's speaker in the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Lecture Series. As a condition of this bequest, we're obligated and happy to tell you how the endowment came to UC Berkeley. It's a story that exemplifies the many ways this campus is linked to the history of California, and the Bay Area. Dr. Charles Hitchcock, a physician for the Army, came to San Francisco during the Gold Rush, where he opened a thriving private practice. In 1885, Charles established a professorship here at Berkeley as an expression of his long-held interest in education. His daughter, Lily Hitchcock Coit, still treasured in San Francisco. For a colorful personality, as well as her large generosity, greatly expanded her father's original gift to establish a professorship at UC Berkeley, making it possible for us to present a series of lectures. The Hitchcock Fund has become one of the most cherished endowments of the University of California, recognizing the highest distinction of scholarly thought and achievement. Thank you, Lily and Charles, and now a few words about Professor Altman. Sidney Altman is internationally renowned for his important contributions to the fields of biochemistry and molecular biology. He and Thomas Cech share the 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their independent studies demonstrating the catalytic ability of RNA. Altman discovered RNA's P and the enzymatic properties of the RNA subunit of that enzyme. He found that RNA, which was previously believed to be simply a passive carrier of genetic codes between different parts of the cell, could also initiate and catalyze reactions. This discovery refuted the formerly unquestioned principle that molecules could either carry information like RNA or catalyze chemical reactions like proteins, but they could not do both. I apologize for the music. Altman's breakthrough opened up many new fields of research and biotechnology, especially focused on RNA structure and function. Professor Altman has been a faculty member at Yale University since 1971, teaching both undergraduate and graduate courses. Also at Yale, he has served as the chair of the Department of Biology, 1983 to 85, and dean of Yale College, 1985 to 89, and is currently the Sterling Professor of molecular, cellular, and developmental biology. Since his Nobel Prize in 1989, he has been awarded honorary degrees from the University of Montreal, York University, Connecticut College, McGill University, the University of Colorado, the University of British Columbia, Dartmouth College, Lake Forest College, Concordia University, and the University of Toronto. In recognition of his illuminating research, Altman has been named a fellow by the University of Colorado, the Damon Runyon Fund, the Anna Fuller Fund, the California Institute of Technology, and Dartmouth College. Altman currently serves on the Committee on Human Rights of the National Academy of Sciences. He has been on the Board of Trustees of the Dibner Institute for the History of Science and Technology. He has received the Rosenthal Award for Basic Biomedical Research, and that was in 1989, the Innovators of Science Award, 1992, the Novartis Drew Award in Biomedical Research in 1999, and is an Einstein Professor of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Glasgow. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sidney Alban. Thank you, Professor Lester, for that very generous introduction. 
I'm of course happy to be here back in Berkeley, especially on such a beautiful day as this one. And I apologize for those of you who've taken a few days or a few hours out of the brilliant sunshine to come and listen to me in this darkened room. But maybe we can make it interesting in some way. Uh, I'm going to talk today about entering the RNA world. And before I talk today and tomorrow, I want to start off by doing something that people usually do at the end of their lectures uh, these days. It's not infrequent these days to see a final slide at somebody's lecture which has about six or seven different awards of money awarded to a different person and 30 or 40 people who participated in the research that's been talked about. I simply want to say that my work over the years has been supported by your taxes. Uh, the money comes from NIH and at one point from NSF. And it's very easy to calculate with round numbers that each of you have given a few pennies a year in terms of your income tax to my research. So I thank all of you for that and I'm grateful for it. And that's why I mention it now and I will mention it again tomorrow. Now, really I should start this lecture with some discussion of um, the origin of life. And I'm not talking about human life, I'm talking about life per se. And one can ask some questions that may have, or you might construe as being of a philosophical bent and you may ask for philosophical answers. Uh, but if I'm asked or pressed hard in that regard, I will simply answer with a grunt or more articulately with a yes or a no. Because I'm really not interested in the philosophy of what I'm going to talk about. So one of the questions we can ask is, why is there life? And after we consider that briefly, you can ask where, when, and how. And then another question we can ask is, why do we do experiments on something that we can never really answer in any unique way? We might get a general answer of what happened four billion years ago, but it's unlikely that we'll get an answer that will exactly duplicate what did happen. And the question then is, should we do experiments? And what do we learn from doing experiments? And my answer to that is, we do experiments in any case, because that is what we do. Uh, in our own nature, we are problem solvers. And if there are questions around, no matter what they are or what field they're in, we'll try and solve that problem. We'll try and answer the questions. OK, so I don't think I can answer about the question about why there is life. It happened. And my preference is to think it happened as a consequence of initially uh, inorganic events uh, that took place in our world. And we went from there. But then the question is, did it take place in our world? Now there is a theory which several people have advanced on this uh, question, partly because they were stumped in terms of trying to think of what happened in our world. That theory, as some of you might recognize, is called panspermia. And the idea is that life or some very extremely primitive example of life was brought to Earth by meteors or meteorites as they fell to Earth that passed through the atmosphere of another planet on which life already existed, or they resulted from impacts on another planet where life already existed, and a rock or several rocks appeared on this planet. Uh, 
There isn't much point in talking more than that. If it did happen on another planet, whatever did happen, perhaps, duplicates what we might think about what happened on our planet. Now, the first slide you see is an illustration taken from an article from Science about maybe 15 years ago that was discussing the origin of life. And it's really rather straightforward, if you can understand it. Here, here we have the formation of Earth, some red ball, red because supposedly there was a lot of volcanic activity, about four and a half billion years ago. And we must remember that the universe started about 11 billion years ago. So this is a relative newcomer. And then we have a stable hydrosphere, which we'll get to again in a few minutes. That is to say, stable composition, chemical composition of the sky and the oceans, both of which are extremely important. 4.2 billion years ago. And about that time, we have prebiotic chemistry. And what does that mean? That simply means from very basic hydrocarbons, some chemicals were formed that could participate in the origin of life as we know it today. And let me just define life for an instance as saying that you have to have information stored in some way in a molecule, and it has to be transmitted accurately from that molecule to daughter molecules. And the accurate transmission is what is most important. Now, these particular little molecules indicated there actually are molecules that are currently important in life. And we don't know whether they were important, say, four billion years ago. And again, I'll get to that shortly. Then we have the pre-RNA world. And I'm not sure what this represents, but it seems to be a parent molecule giving rise to daughters, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not clear exactly what's going on here. And then we have an RNA world. And we'll talk about the origin of that particular term. And it's not clear that there was indeed an RNA world initially, but probably at some point there was an RNA world. And then we have the first DNA protein life, and then diversification of life. And here we have a diagram which is typical of uh, people dealing with evolutionary diagrams indicating various branches occurring from a stem organism back here. OK, so there are some very simple questions. <clears throat> Extremely simple, you will say, or maybe much too simple from what I'm going to tell you, that one has to ask about these particular times, let's say, four billion years ago or so. And they are the nature of the ocean and water. That is to say, what is the chemical nature of the oceans? How much water was there? The nature of the sky? How much oxygen or methane or carbon dioxide was in the sky? The temperature of the sky and the oceans? Electrical discharge in the sky? And the time it took for events we're going to talk about. Now, <clears throat> this is important because I think in 1951, Miller and Urey uh, published a paper in which they put some very simple hydrocarbons. A hydrocarbon is something made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen into a flask. And they irradiated that with UV light, UV light being the equivalent of lightning. And that went on for a few hours. And the experiment was over. They looked at what they saw. And they found a lot of brown gunk in the bottom of the tube. When that was analyzed, they found many simple amino acids. And amino acids are the basic elements of proteins. And so that experiment was regarded as a landmark in terms of indicating uh, that that was all you needed to form life, because you could make uh, essentially amino acids and then proteins from that point. That was at a stage when it was still thought that proteins were essential for the evolution of life. And we know 
I think probably definitely at this point that that certainly was not true. That is to say that proteins were necessary. And of course, initially the sky was probably much more, uh, the percentage of the chemicals in the sky contained much more methane and carbon dioxide rather than oxygen as, as it does now because you had all the emissions from volcanic eruptions over the year and the ocean too was, let's say, contaminated by such chemicals. Now, if you read various uh, periodicals, as most of us do, or most of us who are scientists do, like science and nature, every few weeks or every few months, you will see another paper calculating what the percentage of oxygen of the oceans were, or what percentage of various chemicals there were of the oceans, and how much oxygen there was in the sky. Now, these are not uh, mindless calculations. They are based on the chemical nature of various rocks on the Earth and reasonable assumptions about how they form. So, as you watch these publications from year to year, you will find that these experiments uh, change somewhat. Perhaps that was one of the reasons why I was never extremely interested, let's say, in the quote, origin of life, uh, because to me it seemed like something that we could only speculate about. And in fact, it struck me that this is something you could fruitfully think about in the bathtub, but perhaps nowhere else. Now, this is another uh, graph which illustrates some of the things I just talked about. This was taken from a paper in Nature a few weeks ago from Donahue and Ancliffe about the origin of certain fossils. Uh, but here on this axis, we have the time billions of years ago, four billion right here, and we have the oceans here. They're anoxic up to this point, which means very little or no oxygen at all in the oceans. And then they're sulfitic, which means they have a lot of sulfate ions and other sulfur compounds in them. And then they're oxic at this point here. Now, they, there seem to be sort of transition points here and here, but I will indicate that that's conjecture. If there were changes, and there probably were changes, they probably occurred over a few hundred million years. And the same thing is true when we look at the atmosphere per se. There's supposedly a great oxidation event here at about 2.5 million billion years ago, and the percentage of oxygen went up, stayed constant for a while, then went up again. Now, on the top of the graph, there are various things indicated. Here we have extant stromatolites. Now, these are, we're talking about fossils here. Stromatolites, if you see a picture of them in a rock, they look like spaghetti. It's not absolutely clear that they were fossils, although many people think they were. And in fact, they seem to be given the indication that they were the first living fossils that we can find. So that's about three and a half billion years ago, <coughs> but they already show uh, considerable existence of complex life. So life must have started perhaps 500 million years before that. This paper that I use this figure from is about the Gabon fossils, which are supposedly fossils which indicate the beginning of eukaryotic life, that is, organisms with a nucleus. And here we have we oldest certain bacterial fossils around this, so that's about two and a half million years ago. And then we go up to much more recent times, and of course, humans or pre-human fossils will be just at the limit down here. Now, <clears throat> there is one theory that clays, mineral clays, have something to do uh, with the origin of life. And the idea is that you can have clays, which are of a particular chemical composition in layers, so that, for example, you have a particular layer where the clay is laid down and all the direction of the clays are pointed in one particular axis here. 
And this might be another kind of clay, also laid down in this direction. And these are others here. And the idea was that, this is uh, Graham Karen Smith is one of the principal authors here. The idea was on near the surface of these clays, it's quite probable that the chemical composition of the medium uh, was uniform and distinct from the rest of the surrounding medium, however you want to define that. And in fact, it is suggested that if there were some molecules that were viable in terms of their utility for life, they could be laid down on these strata in a particular uh, direction. And in fact, for example, if you have the uh, DNL amino acids, for example, as one idea where you have stereoisomers of the amino acids, on one of these layers you might only have the L acids, on the other the D acids. The same thing could be true with sugars. So, so this is a way of separating essential molecules that were essential for life. There's no evidence that this is real. Although a lot of people, especially some geologists, put some uh, weight to this kind of theory. Now, <clears throat> 1967, uh, Crick and Orgel and uh, Woese wrote separate articles. Woese wrote a book. And J.D. Bernal, who was towards the end of his life, wrote something in England saying that it seemed possible that RNA could be involved at the beginning of life. Uh, but it was unclear to say that. And Crick, Orgel, and Woes said specifically in their papers that no enzymatic activity or no any kind of activity can be associated with RNA other than its informational content. So it's unlikely that we have to consider RNA for this event at all. Uh, there was a, uh, an idea, and I think Bernal was one of the people who put it forward, that RNA mostly live as a single-stranded molecule. I'll get to that in a second. That is, is, is a long polymer by itself in solution, and it could fold up in various ways in solution. And in fact, in the cell, what was known at that time, it was relatively easy to find it in various parts of the cell. However, DNA was a double-stranded molecule in which the two strands are helically intertwined about each other. And it was fairly inert in terms of chemistry. It lived only in cell nuclei and nowhere else. This is in eukaryotes. So DNA was unlikely to be used if you needed something that could be an interesting molecule. That is, those are weak arguments for RNA possibly being there at the origin of life. And Crick, uh, Orgel, and Woes said, no activity has been shown for RNA, so we'll dispose of it for a while. This is in 67. So let's talk about RNA for a second. And I'm sorry for you professional molecular biologists in the audience. I'm not sorry for your personally. I feel very proud of you in these days when molecular biology seems to be faltering along. Uh, but because you know all this, let me talk about this anyway. So. We have here the phosphate backbone of RNA. Phosphate connected to a sugar, connected to another phosphate sugar. So this is the backbone of one strand of RNA. And connected to each sugar at this end, there is what, what is called a base. Adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil in these particular cases. And the information value of RNA is found in the sequence of the bases because the bases themselves can form complexes or hydrogen bonds with other bases and transmit information in that particular way. So this is an important uh, basic lesson about RNA and what its nature is at the moment. The next slide simply shows another detailed picture of RNA of one particular, two particular subunits here, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and a couple of bases. And here we have various alternatives to the bases that you can make. Diaminopurine, hypoxanthine, et cetera, et cetera. 
various other bases here, which will all have the appropriate hydrogen bonding characteristics. You can have different sugars, different phosphate linkages. In fact, I, in fact, people who do experiments supposedly on the origin of life, I know have made phosphate, have made molecules in which hexoses replayed the riboses in this particular position. And they did perfectly well. They had the bases on the hexose. But in fact, they did not have the right physical chemical properties, as we understand them today, to be uh, ribonucleic acids. However, we do have to admit that there could be a series of molecules that did not have quite the same chemical composition as today's RNA does. So we can admit that, but we're not going to discuss it any further at the moment. Now, here is the classical iconic equation about information transfer today. That is to say, we have DNA making, can be copied into RNA, which can be copied back into DNA. And then RNA can go to what are called ribosomes, and the information RNA will be made into proteins. And you notice here I put genetic information, genetic information because they all have sequences of bases. And here we have structure and biochemical catalysis. You can designate certain parts of proteins as having certain kinds of information. But we have no way of knowing how that information can be replicated and transmitted exactly to another molecule of protein. We just don't know how it's going to happen. And because we don't know, that affects entirely our notions about the origin of life. This is another drawing which is abbreviated from the one I talked about a minute ago. We have the same position here. But in this particular case, we're going to eliminate protein. Because in the original central dogma, which I indicated, all those transformations of DNA making RNA back to DNA, DNA replicating itself, RNA replicating itself, they're all carried out by proteins or protein enzymes. And we'll talk about enzymes in a few minutes. But if we say that proteins didn't exist at the beginning of life, because there's no way you could copy the information of proteins and make more proteins from it, then we're left with this situation here. As it happens, it was then found that RNA could carry out some very simple biochemical reactions. Uh, this was done by Czech in which he showed that RNA could cleave itself under certain conditions. And in our lab where we showed the RNA associated with a, prote with a protein subunit could cleave other pieces of RNA. Now, as scientists always do, and in fact, this is a classic example of that. And the example really was given by Wally Gilbert in a short paper he wrote. Uh, it wasn't a paper, it was a comment he wrote for Nature. And he was a physicist, really. But he became a molecular biologist. You take one or two examples, and you generalize that completely into a, a new theory, encompassing very many problems and events in one particular small or two or three small sentences. He said, now you have information in RNA with biochemical catalysis, okay, information RNA. And before Wally got onto the scene, we could say, this has a possible future. And then Wally said, with one or two events of the kind we're talking about, that means that RNA could have any kind of catalysis. And therefore, it could carry out metabolism inside cells. So life is possible now with only RNA containing the information and biochemical catalysis. And then he said, we don't need DNA at all. Cross this out here. It's just not necessary. We have RNA. Presumably, it could make itself under some conditions. It can carry out metabolic reactions. This is all we know. 
and that was the beginning, and he called it the RNA world. So most of the thinking about these events now are directed to the RNA world, and really that's what we have to wonder about. Now, this is a very old slide that Hugh Robertson made many years ago, and it just illustrates what kinds of structures RNA can be involved in. First of all, when you have something that looks like this, which you can call a double-stranded piece of RNA, there are actually these bases here are joined together by very weak bonds called hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bond was suggested by Linus Pauling back around 1940, and I thought it was much more important than a structure of proteins. Uh, so here's another place where you have another particular double-stranded region held together by hydrogen bonds, and here are particular bases, A, U, C, G, U, A, et cetera, where we know what the hydrogen bonds are. They're stuck together here. Here's another one here. The point is that we have many sequences in RNA where you have these supposed hairpins here. And in fact, if you look at any stretch of RNA, you will find hairpins. There's no question about it that the bases occur sufficiently frequently that, so that you will find regions like this in RNA. In fact, this is another diagram taken from something that was written about 10 years ago or so. If you have a region of RNA with a number of hairpins in it, and then you have something like the RNA subunit of RNAs P, which could many years ago be called something else. We call it M1 for various reasons. We know how this cleaves RNA. It actually cuts at the region between the beginning of a double strand here and a single strand. So this is left by itself. Here's another cut here. You're left with this hairpin by itself. Here's another cut here. So you're left with a bunch of different hairpins with sizes down here of different lengths. And then you could well imagine that you might, for example, attach a three nucleotide sequence here, CCA, and that, in fact, can happen inorganically. We know that happens. And ultimately, from this, you might wind up with something that looks like a piece of transfer RNA. Transfer RNA is very important today. It's involved in protein synthesis. So this is a speculative but simple idea of how very simple chemical reactions can occur in RNA a very long time ago. Now, <clears throat> there was some notion after Gilbert suggested the RNA world that we really ought to look for other enzymatic reactions carried out by RNA. We do know of some other reactions at the moment, but there aren't very many of them. Uh, and they fall into a very specific class. There are no more than five or so. Uh, Larry Gold, who was at the University of Colorado, uh, devised a technique, and it's illustrated here, but I, I'm not going to go through it all in detail. In fact, I would suggest for those of you who don't understand anything I say, uh, just forget it. Just uh, think about the more important, well, what, what I think are the more important things. Uh, Larry said the following. If you make a randomized piece of RNA, by randomized I mean the following. That is to say, you can chemically make a piece of RNA now. Uh, and you can, I, you can put in a specific base at every position. But Larry said, we'll put in all four bases at every position so that you could make one sequence, you put in four bases at one position, it means you now have four different sequences, et cetera. So he made a piece of RNA that had maybe 75 or so random RNA nucleotides in it and did a reaction uh, to, well, he, he made this. It was in a test tube. He maybe had a mil, uh, one milliliter of the reaction, which might have had a trillion, trillion different sequences in it. He said, now, if you have a very special way of selecting for a particular function from this series, and I won't go into the details yet, here's the RNA population. 
we have a means of selecting one particular function for it. That means that out of the trillion, trillion pieces of RNA, we have one RNA that has the function uh, we want. Then using the tricks of molecular biology at that time, which is cDNA synthesis, which is to make DNA from this selected piece of RNA, and then amplify it with PCR amplification, which even high school students know how to do about right now, but I would surmise that they know nothing about the details. Uh, then you can, in fact, amplify that one piece of RNA into a million and a million pieces of RNA, and then you can characterize it. So that, is, that was a very clever and important reaction that Gold hypothesized. And let's just uh, talk about what an enzyme is. An enzyme is a catalyst. If you put, many years ago, lead in your gasoline, it accelerated the combustion of gasoline. So lead was a catalyst. In biochemistry, an enzyme is a catalyst that works in a chemical sense over and over, again on another class of molecules, substrates. Substrate is here, and it's unchanged by the reaction. So one of the enzymes we can talk about is ribonuclease P, or its RNA subunit, and its substrate is other RNA molecules that just cuts them. So that's an enzyme, that's a substrate. Now, about 10 years ago, I made this particular list of enzymes using Gold's technique, which people had already isolated and characterized. And you can see many of the particular enzymes that are involved uh, in effective replication and metabolism to D, uh, in DNA inside cells today. And if you did this again today, it would have maybe three times as many enzymes involved. So there was, didn't seem to be any inhibition in RNA having any particular enzyme you can imagine. And the idea is that in each one of these cases, the RNA that we're talking about would be folded in a different way to encompass its substrate and then perform a chemical reaction with it. And we also have RNA with small molecules attached. We've recently shown that a pyrimidine synthesis can occur. That's one class of bases. This has nothing to do with Gold's technique, but it's been shown that this can be done. And we have RNA self-replication, which I'll talk about briefly. So this is another success in terms of RNA, and in showing that the RNA world existed at some level. The question is, why doesn't it exist now? We haven't found any of these reactions in nature today. We can make them in a test tube, but we haven't found them at all. The question is, one, were there random pieces of RNA around so that you had the ability to choose one specific one from everything you did at one time? And secondly, was there enough time around for you to do everything? It's not clear that that is the case. This is just a diagram of an RNA self-replication scheme that Jerry Joyce at the Salk Institute published about a year or so ago. Let me just say that he showed it could work. Now, with two pieces of RNA in a reaction, he showed that they could replicate themselves entirely. So there's no protein involved here. It's just RNA which replicates itself. And I'll just very briefly go over it. Here you have one piece of RNA and another piece of RNA here. OK, here they are, here and here. Then you have an enzymatic reaction which joins this piece to this piece. And we know that RNA can do that. OK? So now we have these two pieces completely joined. OK, this is the other reaction going on here. And now this is an enzyme of one kind, presumably. Here it is here. Here again is A and B, which the complexes look different because they're the complements of the original strand here. And we can go on and on and on in this cycle. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore at this point. It's just showing replication can take place if you're clever enough in thinking about it. Now, let me talk a little bit about what we know about RNA today. This is just a very small summary of catalytic RNAs today. In fact, the summary, if I drew a complete list, would not be very much bigger than this. So this is important because 
This, we think, are reactions of catalysis by RNA, which are probably very ancient reactions, and I'm not going to go into the arguments about why they're very ancient, but they exist in today's world. There's the RNA subunit of RNAs P, there's cleavage of other RNA. The group one introns, which was discovered by Tom Cech, he showed that in a piece of RNA, which is, let's say, this long, there was one piece here that functioned inside the cell, and another piece here that functioned inside the cell, and in between, there was another region that did not function inside the cell, and he showed that that region in between could be cut out and the two end regions could be joined together in what is called a splicing reaction. So that was a very important reaction to show. Group two introns are similar, they were discovered later. These particular reactions are very important reactions. Plant viroid RNAs are about 350 nucleotides long, so they're pretty small. They don't, have, they don't code for any proteins at all. And they're circular, and they're single-stranded. So in fact, you can have a little bit of plant viroid RNA on your fingertips and rub it into the leaf of the plant that is the host for this viral RNA, and that plant will become sick entirely and die within 30 days, let's say if it's a tomato plant or something like that. So the plant viroid RNAs are very important pathogens for plants. Many of the commercially important plants have plant viroids, and we have to prevent the viroids from infecting them. Hepatitis delta RNA is a little bit, not much different, but a little bit different. It's 1,600 nucleotides long. It codes for one protein. It's single-stranded. It can be found in the human bloodstream. But if you have hepatitis B virus in your bloodstream, and you also have the hepatitis delta RNA, you're dead within three weeks. So the hepatitis uh, delta RNA makes hepatitis B a serious and lethal uh, disease. Normally, not normally, but yeah, normally. You can live for several years with a hepatitis B infection. You might get sick one way or the other, and in some people it develops into a cancer. But it is nothing that will destroy you in three weeks. And in certain parts of the world, normally Southeast Asia, the blood banks constantly screen their supplies for hepatitis delta RNA. That's just an, an aside. There's a fungal virus that has an RNA that cleaves itself. And recently, we have evidence that RNA in ribosomes at the peptide elongation site also is an RNA enzyme. That is to say, the RNAs by themselves will join one amino acid to another. Now, this is extrapolating a little bit from what we know about the crystals of ribosomes, which have been just described in the last seven or eight years or so, it appears if you draw a sphere around the point where two amino acids get joined together, there is no protein in that sphere, but simply RNA. And that's the reason for saying that uh, the ribosomal RNA is a, is a uh, RNA enzyme. There are some people, in fact, some rather prominent ribosomologists who disagree with that statement, but that's okay. We'll accept that for the moment. And splicing RNAs, there are various complexes inside cells which aid in splicing pieces of RNA, can perform an artificial splicing reaction by themselves in vitro. But it's not important that one remember this, one simply has to remember that there are several different reactions where we know this happens. Now I'm going to talk very, very briefly about RNAs P and a couple of other reactions. What I've shown here is a tRNA. This structure here in two dimensions is a transfer RNA. The dots indicate hydrogen bonds joining these pieces together. And this sequence up here is actually made from DNA when you're making this piece of RNA, but we don't need it inside the cell. And the enzyme I'm talking about, the RNA subunit of RNAs P, cuts it right here. And it cuts 
all tRNA precursors in all organisms at this particular point. So that's one thing we know about. This is the check reaction which I resolved, uh, which I discussed. Here are the two pieces which are important. And this piece in the intermediate here gets spliced out. There are two parts of the reaction. There's a G that's at the five prime side here, one side of it. And that gets cut out. And then there's a, a hydroxyl group here. And that moves over here. And then we cut that out. And we're left with this particular reaction here, which are the two pieces joined together. And we're left with this piece here, which is called an intron, as a separate molecule here. So this is a reaction. And we don't have to worry about this circle here. Actually, it's just a linear piece here. This, is, this reaction is a cell splicing reaction, which from the definition of enzymes means it's not a real enzyme. <clears throat> but this product of the reaction here can, with various uh, minor modifications, be turned into an enzyme. But it doesn't work that way normally in nature. This is another view of the central dogma as I do it before, as I drew it before. But this is today's view. And this appeared in another uh, paper recently. And it simply indicates to you that the world is much more complicated than we had thought. Uh, here's DNA or chromatin being made into RNA. And we have, could have messenger RNA here being made into proteins. But there are telomeres involved in making sure the DNA is the right size in chromosomes. There's primer RNA involved in the replication of DNA. This RNA can be transcribed, various pieces of RNA can be transcribed into RNAs P, small nuclear RNA, et cetera, these here, S and ORNAs also. And these work on tRNAs, tmRNA, which we can talk, ribosomal RNA, 7SL RNA. These are all substrates for these reactions. And these particular reactions here, pieces of RNA, microRNA, siRNA, other NC or non-coding RNAs, are involved in regulating hundreds of developmental reactions. What I want to show here is simply that these new RNAs here, which have been discovered over the last 10 to 15 years, are where the action is today in molecular biology. Uh, you might consider that statement a bit of propaganda. But in fact, I think it's true. Uh, those RNAs are essential and controlling developmental events in higher organisms, and in fact, lower organisms, but not extremely primitive eukaryotes. And the future of biology for the next 10 years or so depends upon our understanding of those particular reactions. I'm not, these are just lists of what we have to do, and I don't think it's important to talk about those. One of the things that is the hallmark of evolution as life went on is that whatever systems we're talking about became more complex. I'm not talking just about bacteria becoming man ultimately. That's certainly complexity. But this is complexity at a molecular level. So we have new genes and new mutations to aid in providing basic information. This is very important in terms of what we've learned about molecular biology or about genetics in the last five years or so. At the molecular level, we utilize everything in the genome. There's no more junk DNA. All parts of DNA are utilized in one way or another in terms, as we understand it now, to make non-coding RNA or microRNA that control developmental events. We're just beginning to understand non-coding RNAs which are RNAs of several thousand nucleotides long. And we don't really know what they do. We do know what one of them does, certainly. That's the exist RNA, which is important in inactivating an X chromosome in human females. Human females have two Xs, and one of them is inactivated in all cells. And the exist RNA, which is a few thousand nucleotides long, is critical for that particular function. And I won't talk about that 
uh, anymore at the moment. It's getting late, and I wanted to end this lecture with a statement about some of the people who have um, I won't say mentors, because they weren't really mentors. They're people I admired enormously as I was growing up in science. And they had a huge effect on me of one kind or another. Uh, Leonard Lerman and Matt Messelson and Sidney Brenner. But there was one people who I never actually worked for. He was one of the people at the lab where I was for two years in England, and he ultimately went on to win two Nobel, two Nobel Prizes. His name was Fred Sanger. And I'm going to end this lecture by reading very briefly something about Fred Sanger that I wrote a few years ago. I was doing an experiment in which I was using radioactivity, radioactive phosphorus in much higher quantities than we use them now. And I had spilled something on my desk, and it was sufficient large accident that I felt I had to tell the people responsible. And the person I wound up with was Fred Sanger from his lab upstairs from mine. And so this is what I'm going to read. Fred listened to me and came downstairs to the second floor. Without a word, he put on some rubber dishwashing gloves, grabbed a can of Ajax and some sponges, and knelt down to try to see how much radioactivity could get off the floor. Not much. I objected to what he was doing because I thought I should be doing that job. And quite soon he said that I had done enough and decided to clear the area. I stripped my clothing off, donned a lab coat, and drove home where I left the clothes in the coal shed to cool off. Hugh Robertson called the contaminated space Yucca Flats, which I thought was pretty good. And sometime later that whole floor and bench area were removed. I cannot imagine a person of Fred's reputation taking on such a modest and thankless task and refusing any help. The image of him on his knees on the floor trying to wash away the radioactivity I had spilled is still fresh in my mind. There are many ways, I suppose, of exhibiting humility and greatness, and this was one of them. Thank you. Well, the question is, could I speculate about the possibility of, of an actual organism that had no protein at all in it, it was just RNA? Um, I doubt whether that existed at any particular time, but uh, anything I say now can be used against me in court at any time. Um, one of the kinds of experiments where some people are doing at the moment is to make lipid spheres, in which case you then try and have RNA enclosed by the lipid, or you have RNA going through a hole in the lipid. The idea is that lipids, or fatty molecules, make up most of our cell membranes and walls, so that is important. Now, we are learning something about making the lipids, but it strikes me as being very remotely possible that there might be RNA with a metabolism at the moment. You have to have all those RNAs I mentioned before carry out metabolic reactions. I doubt that that's possible. We might be able to talk about very small lipid spheres with one or two things going on it that ultimately evolved to something else. But that's about all I'll say at the moment. Uh, so considering our estimates of the age and size of the universe, and considering your own personal guess at the unlikelihood of unique origins of life, uh, would you say that our universe is old enough and big enough to allow for two unique origins of life? And although I'll accept a grunt, I would prefer something more concrete. <laughs> uh, you say that there could be two different origins? Yeah, sure, no problem. There, there are 
reasonable estimates now that there are possibly hundreds of planet, Earth-like planets in the universe which we're just waiting to discover. And the idea that one of them might have conditions like those on Earth is quite possible. So without any hesitation, I'll say that it's quite possible that there's another source of life somewhere in the universe. It may not be life as we recognize it, but that's OK. So I'm one of those geochemists that actually tries to disentangle what the early Earth was like. Uh, and a lot of my friends are geobiologists who study things like hopanoids and other molecules that may be biomarkers of early, I'd say, uh, unicellular life. But we don't talk to you guys that often. And so I want to know from a molecular biologist's perspective, what, uh, what sort of signatures could we be looking for? Uh, again, I, I work on the, the inorganic stuff, but uh, I'm curious because it felt a little disparaging. Signatures of the existence of life? Sure. Or, you know, the, the, I mean, once you go back far enough in the rock record, things are very much degraded. Uh, there's not much that we actually have from early when well, things may have started. If we're looking for life as we know it, then one has to look for the existence of a polymer that has information, okay? There could be something like RNA or DNA. Uh, but what people have looked for in the past, for example, on the probes of Mars, right. is metabolism mm -hmm. and the production of certain kinds of gases. Right. So what else can I say? That's what people do. I mean, it's simple to look for metabolites of one kind or another that we know do not exist in the inorganic world. Mm -hmm. OK, just curious. Why do you think that the bases are restricted to the five bases uh, you know, in DNA and RNA, uh, when I understand there are many other bases that could possibly fit in? Yeah. Well, people actually have synthesized other bases uh, which have the ability to hydrogen bond. And they can, they can use these other bases, which are not like the ones, the five that we talked about, the four that I talked about. And they work in terms of reactions in the test tube. Uh, so that's why I say with some degree of certainty that it's likely that we might have had something else other than recognizable RNA at one time. And again, let us thank uh, Professor Altman for a very splendid and interesting presentation.